be clear. All right. Yes, so Andres, it definitely sounds better to me. Okay, great. Right, I, I yeah. turned up the input volume pretty much to max. And, and we've um, got Jack and Kenneth telling us that they're hearing fine, so thank you, Jack and Kenneth. Um, before we start, we're going to start in just a couple minutes. You see all of us that are online today. Andre Smarty is our uh, first speaker, and then Scott Steckety is our second. And joining me to help answer questions as the webinar goes along is Elizabeth DeCarly. So we're going to start in just a second. I just want to point out a couple things. You are on mute throughout the webinar just because of background noises, as you can see on the screen there. Um, so the best way to contact us, communicate with us, is through the um, uh, question panel. Simply type your question in and we will respond. And if it's something we need to ask Scott or Andres, we'll just ask it out loud. So that's the best way to communicate during the webinar. And I am going to turn things over to Andres, but before I do, I did want to point out Andres is on a Mac computer, and so periodically you're going to see his control panel. It looks like a big black blob um, when he's trying to get his poll questions out. So that's what that black blob is, and he will get that out of the way as soon as um, he can. But it's not something wrong with your computer. It's just the Mac issue that we have. All right, Andres, I'm going to turn things over to you. And okay. You are in control. All right. Do we see my screen now? We see your screen. All right. Well, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. My name is Andres Marty, and I work here at Key Curriculum Press. And uh, we'll be doing a presentation today on modeling periodic motion. And uh, you can see that the, the, there's three uh, things that we'll definitely get to, a uh, fourth maybe, um, but we are going to construct sine waves geometrically, we'll build a Ferris wheel, we'll create a scrambler, which is a more complex version of a Ferris wheel, also known by other names, and um, if we have time, we'll try to get to the um, unifying circular and trig functions. Um, <clears throat> so the people that we have today are myself, and I've been working here at Key Curriculum Press for about seven years. Before that, I was a classroom teacher for 13 years, high school teacher, and I use lots of Sketchpad in the classroom. Scott Steckety works at KCP Technologies. He'll be the other co-presenter today. And then we have Elizabeth and Karen helping out answering questions. If you have any questions at any time, just ask them using the control panel, and uh, they'll get back to you. It also help, and you know, we will also answer questions that come up. So please, please do ask the questions that you have. Um, and uh, without further ado, we'll get started. Uh, for those of you that have been to some of our previous webinars, uh, one thing that's going to be nice about today is that everything we do today will start from scratch. We're not going to be using any of our pre-built models, and in fact, what we're going to be focusing on is building models yourself from scratch. And so we're going to start with the sine wave tracer. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to see, uh, see, here's the problem I run into when I hide my dock, Karen. Oh, there we go. All right. I have a poll question for you. So how many of you have used the Sketchpad 5 Learning Center? Please answer yes, no, or you have no idea what I'm talking about. And we'll give you a few seconds here to answer that question. How many have used the Sketchpad 5 Learning Center? Looks like most of you have voted. And so I'm going to close the poll, share the results. And uh, I'm not surprised by this answer. Um, I did a workshop a few weeks ago for a group that just started that had Sketchpad 5, and they didn't even know what the Learning Center was. And um, it looks like 80% of you either don't use the Learning Center or you don't know what it is. And uh, so before we go any farther, you know, this hiding the doc thing is just going to drive me nuts. Let me hide this. Let me show you the Learning Center. It comes with Sketchpad. If you have Sketchpad 5, you already have the Sketchpad 5 Learning Center. You can get to it from the startup screen or you can get to it at any time by going to the Help in Sketchpad and clicking on Learning Center. And this Learning Center is built into Sketchpad. It's not something you're going online for. It's actually local. And it has a tremendous amount of resources that we put together to really help people in response to the questions. You know, people have said you know, it would be really helpful to have something other than a blank sketch that shows you how to use Sketchpad. So if you go to the Using Sketchpad part of the Learning Center, 
you'll see uh, first of all that we have 20 getting, I'm sorry, 12 getting started tutorials and each of these tutorials leads you through step by step and you can have this open up simultaneously with Sketchpad so you can work through this. Um, you know, so for example, you know, learning how to format or how to hide an object or how to construct an equilateral triangle and then each of these sections is further supported by a video and uh, for the videos you will need to be online because but the videos are actually streamed from an from online location. So that's the only part of the Learning Center that you need to have internet access for is to watch the videos. Um, but everything else is there. There's also a whole section on Sketchpad tips, which would allow you how to do things, you know, how do you construct a perpendicular. You can either view a movie or you can see a local um, one-page comic tip that shows you how to do this. And this is something that any student or teacher using Sketchpad 5 has locally on their machine and they can access. So what we're going to do today is really uh, the first activity is essentially the sine wave tracer, which is one of the last tutorials that's in the Learning Center. And uh, without further ado, let's start. In this sine wave tracer, we're going to start with a segment. If you hold down the shift key when you make a segment, it'll go in 15 degree increments. So that makes it easy to make a perfectly vertical or horizontal line. So I'm going to make this horizontal line. And then I'm going to use the circle tool to construct a circle on one end. And I'm going to start labeling my points here. So we'll call the endpoints the segment A and B, and this point that controls the size of the circle C. You notice that this point is the point that will determine how large that circle is. And then we're going to have a couple of points that move. I'm going to go ahead and use the point tool to construct one point that's on the line on the segment. Notice how the segment highlights when I'm on it. And so what that will cause is a point that is constructed to be on the segment. I can't pull it off. And I'm going to use the point tool to also construct a point on the circle. Again, notice how the circle highlights when I'm on it. So in this model, we're going to use the point on segment AB to control the horizontal position of a point that we're going to be looking at. So I'm going to select this point. Let's go ahead and label it. I'll label this D and this one E. I'm going to select point D and I'm also going to select the segment and go to the construct menu and construct a perpendicular line. So this line remains perpendicular to AB. Point E is going to control the horizontal, I'm sorry, the vertical position. So I'm going to construct a line through point E that's parallel to AB. So I select both, both the point and the segment and construct a parallel line. And now you can see that as I drag E, it's controlling the vertical position of the point that I haven't constructed yet, but I will now. I want a point that's at the intersection of these two lines. So I'm going to click on the point tool. And when I'm at the intersection, notice how both lines are highlighted. And when they're both highlighted, I'll construct a point, use the text tool again to label it, and this is point F. And point F is the point that we're interested in right now. So if you look at point F, as I drag point D, you can see that the horizontal location of point F is controlled by the position of D and the vertical position of point F is controlled by point E, which is on the circle. All right, so for me, when I first did this activity many years ago, it was one of those pivotal moments in my math education where something made sense to me that I had either never really understood or never even really thought about in, in these terms. And so I find this to be a really powerful activity in that we're going to generate a sine curve by joining together two fundamental motions. One is the motion of a point along a segment, and the other is the motion of a point along a circle. So you have just 
these two different types of motion, linear motion and circular motion. And then when you join them, you get something that, well, let's see what we get. In order to do this, I'm going to create an action button. I want to have D and E move together at the same time. So I'm going to go to Edit, Action Buttons, Animation. And I'm given uh, some properties of this action button. Right now it says that point D will move bidirectionally along segment 1 at medium speed, and point E will go counterclockwise around the circle at medium speed. So they're both going at a sketchpad defined medium speed, so they're going the same speed. That's what I want. And I do want the circle point E to go around the circle counterclockwise, but I don't want D to go back and forth. I want it to go in one direction only. So I'm going to change it so it's going forward, and uh, I'm done. So I click OK. So I'm going to go ahead and click this button. Let's see what happens. So D is moving forward. E is moving around the circle. And when D gets to the end, it just starts all over again. So it's always kind of going, when it gets to B, it goes back to A. And E just continues to go around the circle. OK, so I'll stop this for a second. And now what I want to do is you might have been paying attention to F's uh, path as they were moving, but it will be easier to tell where it went if I trace it. So I'm going to select F and go to Trace Intersection. And let me press this again. And now you'll see that point F is leaving a trace as it moves. And uh, you'll let it run for a little while. You can see it's creating this very distinct oscillating shape, the, the shape of what, if your students are familiar with trig functions, they would know that it is a sine curve or perhaps a cosine curve. Even if your students are not familiar with trigonometric functions, they should recognize this as a sort of a graph that they've seen before. You'll see a lot, like if you look at rain level patterns in countries or amount of sunlight over the year, um, tides. There's a lot of things uh, that we see in, in graphic forms that are sort of have this oscillating behavior. But as I let it run longer and longer, I'm also noticing that I'm getting this sort of spirograph looking design, which looks pretty cool. But what I really want to know is, is there a way I can make this trace back over itself so that's the same every time instead of being different every time? Um, so I'm going to stop this for a second and erase the traces, and take a look at it again. So, all right, right now it's going down, and it's going up, and then it's coming down again. But it didn't quite match up to where I started. It, it went a little too far, so I'm not sure if I need to make this bigger or smaller. Uh, I'm just going to try one thing. So I'm going to make my original segment A, B, a little bit shorter. Now it looks like, what's this anyway? That's just a random line I don't need. Okay, so uh, I'm going to erase the traces and run it again and see what happens now. Well, that looks even worse. All right, so let's try the opposite. Let's try to make this longer. And I could keep doing this and just sort of do it by trial and error until I get it. But it, <clears throat> this will be my last attempt just by pure trial and error. Pretty close. So it looks like it's a little long. But I, what I want you to notice is that so far we have not used any numbers at all. This has just been done purely geometrically with just a segment and uh, Oops, I did hide a line I need. With just a segment and a circle, we have generated this, this curve, and there's no numbers involved. But now I do want to bring some numbers into this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and erase the traces again. I'm going to select the circle and go to Graph Define Unit Circle. So now this circle will define the location of 1 on both axes because it is a unit circle with a radius of 1. 
Um, I'm going to go ahead and make the circle just a little bit smaller. You'll see that the graph adjusts with it. I'm going to move everything here to the right a little bit. I'm sorry, to the left a little bit so we have a little bit more room. And, uh, and now, you know, before I probably had B over here somewhere and it seemed to be too small. And then I moved over here and it seemed to be too big. So I'm going to ask you to answer another poll question. Before I ask this question, take a good look at this graph. And maybe what I'll do is let me run it one more time before I ask this question. I'm going to erase the traces. And let's run it through. Right now, the location of B looks like it's 7 point, I don't know, 3 or something, roughly. And um, that seems to be too large. Looking at this, here is your question. I don't see the poll on my screen. Do you guys see it? Oh, there it is. We can I see, see it. it. Okay. Good. So the curve will trace over itself when the x value of b is, is less than 6, exactly 6, or more than 6. All right, looks like we got about two-thirds of you voting, three-quarters now. And we'll let it go for another five seconds, get the rest of you to vote. About 83%. All right, we'll stop it now and share the results. So it looks like the vast majority of you said more than six. But about, you know, one in five people said exactly six or less than six. So let's take a look. Sorry for my clumsiness on, on the computer here, but I'm going to hide these results and bring back my sketch if I can get that back. Hide this box. Okay, well, <clears throat> if I go to exactly six, And I erase the traces and animate it again. It's pretty close, but it's still off a little bit. And it does turn out that the majority of you that said more than six will be correct. In fact, those of you that said more than six, I suspect most of you could tell me exactly where it would be. Um, and this is really a great introduction to the entire concept of radians. And uh, if, we th if we think about this for a second, let me, let me bring this back over here. Okay, if we start D right here, we start E right here. E is going once around the circle by the time it gets back to where this same location here. So, you know, since the radius is 1, it is going around a little over six times to get around the circle because it's the circumference of the circle. The circumference of the circle with a radius of one is two pi, which is a little over six. So um, that's to get to, to get a perfect one, you would need to start and have it end at a little at six a little over six, six point two eight, this is the decimal approximation. Now, that was pretty good, but let's say I wanted to get it perfect. I'm going to show you one thing you could do to get an exact location. I'm going to uh, move this away for a second. Let me go ahead and erase those traces again. And uh, what I'm going to do now is plot a point using the graph menu. I'm going, I want to plot the point either 6.28, but even better would be to plot the point 2 pi. And in Sketchpad 5, you can now just type in 2 and, and P on the keyboard, and when you type P on the keyboard, you get pi. So I want the x-coordinate to be 2 pi, the y-coordinate to be 0. And now I plot that point at exactly 2 pi. I'm now going to select B and the point I just plotted and go to merge points. And so now B has been merged to be at exactly 2 pi. And if I animate now, I should and find that I get exactly one full quote-unquote sine curve. 
certainly of this form. One other cool thing about Sketchpad 5 is that I can now change this, these units so I can go to grid form. Right now it's, I'm going to put, I'm going to select trigonometric axes. It's going to ask if I want to switch to radians. I'm going to say yes. And now you can see that the end point of our curve is 2 pi. And you can also see how the units are broken up by um, increments of pi. Okay, I'm going to move on to uh, the next activity, unless there are any questions right now, Karen. Um, there do not. Oh, wait, here's one. Um, can you remind them how point F is related to point E or what it's tracing? So point F is being, its, its location is being determined by the movement of points D and E. D determines its position horizontally. As D goes across from left to right, that's the horizontal position of F. The vertical position of F is controlled by E. So depending on how far above the x-axis E is as it travels around the unit circle or below the x-axis as it is now, F will have the same vertical coordinate as E. So E is controlling the vertical coordinate. D is controlling the horizontal coordinate. Okay. Um, and question is, is it possible for the graph to begin at the origin? Sure. Good question. So if I want to start it at the origin, then uh, let's bring, well, I want D to be at the origin when I start this process. At the time that E is also at, has a vertical component of zero. So I'm going to bring it so E is not is, is on the x-axis. And if I erase the traces here and start it from here, you will now get a, an actual, oh, I can't remember if it's sine or cosine curve, the one that starts at 0 and not at 1. I think it's a sine curve. Someone said sine. Sure. Someone said sine. Good. <laughs> sine starts <right>. at 0. <laughs> All right, quick, on to the next activity. Um, there is a question real quick. Can you get the trig graph in version 4? And the answer to that is no, it's only in version 5. The trig axes are only in version 5. You can do this entire activity except for putting the trig axes right. in, in Sketchpad 4. Because it's really just based on the motion of a, on a segment and motion on a circle. Right. Anyway, for me, this was like a, this was one of those, for me, this was one of those activities where I had a whole new perspective on what exactly a sine curve actually is, what it represents. I'm hearing a lot of noise from somebody. One of you two, I don't know if it's Scott it's or It's me. Canada. I'm turning it off. I'm turning it off. Okay. All right. I'm going to go on to uh, the next activity, and this activity comes from our online course. Uh, sorry about this, but the... Uh, we also have online, online courses, and uh, we have a, at different levels, and uh, in one of the courses, which I'm just going to show you real quick, in the uh, geometry course, and I believe maybe in the middle school course as well, but I'm sure that in the geometry course, for example, the one that's just going on now, in the third week, there is a project and this is what we're going to be looking at, the Ferris Wheel Project. And the Ferris Wheel Project uh, is to construct your own Ferris Wheel. And to give you an idea of what we're looking at, if we have this little applet here at the beginning of this week, and we want to create something that's like this. So if I click this button, we've got this Ferris Wheel, and we see that these chairs are going around the Ferris Wheel. And uh, we want to create this from scratch. And the first question I have for you then is this. So <clears throat> the question is, what kind of uh, transformations are needed to make a Ferris wheel? I think it's pretty clear that rotations are part of it. But the question is, are rotations enough? Can you make a Ferris wheel with only rotations, or does it also require reflections 
or translations or all of the above? All right, we've got about well, over half of you voted. Oh, we're up to two-thirds all of a sudden. And a few more people to vote before we close the poll. And uh, we're three-quarters mark, so it's, tell us what you think. Rotations alone, rotations plus reflections plus translations are all three. And, uh, okay, well, up to 81%, and I think I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and move on. So... Here's what we got. Um, so about a fifth of you thought rotations alone were enough. A little under half also thought translations were necessary. And then a third of you thought translations and reflections were necessary. So let's, uh, let's go to this activity. I'm not going to give away the answer yet. Hide the results. And let's take a look. So the easiest part of constructing the Ferris wheel is to make the wheel. So we have the wheel. This point's going to control the size of the wheel. Um, but I need another point that can move around the Ferris wheel. So I'm going to go ahead and construct this point here. And for right now, I'm actually going to hide this point just so I don't confuse it with the one that I can move. So I'm hide this point. And this point can move around the Ferris wheel. Now, another great thing about Sketchpad 5 is that you can just drag and drop images into Sketchpad now from anywhere, web, from the web, from your own digital camera. camera. Um, we also provide you with a picture gallery that's internal to Sketchpad 5. So if you go to the picture gallery, you'll see that there are different parts. You can, we basically gathered a, very, uh, a good cross-section of images that you have permissions to use in your own classrooms uh, with your students. Um, there's some pretty interesting ones here in the curve fitting. Um, you know, you can do some interesting stuff here. I'll let you look at this stuff on your own. Uh, I love some of these uh, perspective photos too that you can use to for activities. But we're doing transformations right now, and what I really need is that little chair. The, the, Ferris wheelchair. So in Sketchpad 5, you can now just drag and drop images in. You take them from our picture gallery, again, or you can go to the web or your own digital photos. It's fun to bring in digital photos of kids in your class because it all automatically makes the activity 100 times more interesting. All right, let's make this smaller so it looks about the right size, scale-wise. And uh, you can attach uh, images to points. So. The first thing I'm going to have to decide is, well, how many chairs do I want to put on my Ferris wheel? So I'm going to have you decide. How many chairs should we add? Four, five, six, or eight? Uh-oh. I was hoping this wouldn't be the case, but clearly the majority has determined they want eight chairs, which will take a little bit longer than four, five, or six, but so be it. All right, we'll share the results. You guys want a Ferris wheel with lots of chairs on it. All right, we'll do a Ferris wheel with lots of chairs on it. So in order to do that, I'm going to have to take this point. This is going to be where my Ferris wheel attaches, and I'm going to need seven more points around here to attach Ferris wheels. And I'm going to do that by taking this point in the center and marking it the center. And then I'm going to rotate this point by how much? Let's call this point P, since my poll question calls it point P. And the question is, how much do I have to rotate point P so that I can create my Ferris wheel? Forty-five, seventy-two, sixty, or ninety? Hmm. 
Looks like we got three quarters of you voting. A few more seconds. All right, we got people in two camps here. Another couple of seconds. Okay, we've got over 80% vote. Last chance to vote. And, uh, well, let's go. Close it. So, most of you pick 45 degrees. A few of you pick 60. I was hoping we were going to do a six. Uh, uh, Ferris wheel with six seats, in which case the answer would have been 60, but with eight seats, the answer is 45 degrees because one full turn is 360 degrees. 360 divided by eight is 45. So, get back to my sketch. And I'm going to select point P and uh, rotate it by 45 degrees. And then repeat that process as many times as it takes. All right. So that gives me a Ferris wheel with eight points where I want to attach chairs. And at each of these points, I want to attach a chair. So let's try one thing first. I'm going to just select this and copy it. And I'm going to select point P and go to Edit Paste. And uh, that sort of worked. Um, the problem is, if you look at this, the problem is that uh, the chair doesn't attach to the wheel in the middle of the chair. It attaches at the top. So this was pretty close, but we want to do better. So we want to go ahead and take this away. The other thing I'm going to want to be able to do later on is animate this thing. So I'm just going to go ahead and take care of that right now. I'm going to choose an animation button that rotates point P so that later on when our Ferris wheel is ready to go, I can just press this point and it will make the Ferris wheel go. And I'll go ahead and hide the label for P. And uh, <clears throat> so now the question is, okay, how do I attach this so that the top of this image is at the top of this point? Well, this gets uh, a little tricky, and I'm not going to spend, uh, there's probably other ways, probably better ways to do it than the way I'm going to do it, but this is the first way I thought of. I'm going to make this point, um, this is the free point, and I'm going to translate it using the transform menu. I'm going to translate it, uh, let's see, I want to go rectangular, and I want to translate it horizontally one centimeter and vertically, not at all. Okay. And then I want to do the same thing uh, in the opposite direction. So I want to translate it negative one centimeters horizontally. Okay. And so now these are going to be the sort of upper left and right corners of my image. And this will be the point that I actually want to attach. But I also need to drop these two points down to create a sort of a frame for my image. So I'm going to translate both of these zero in the horizontal direction and say probably like negative four. That's a little big, maybe negative three. That looks pretty good. So in Sketchpad 5, you can attach an image to points. And I'm not going to go into the details of that. You can always look it up very quickly. Uh, again, in the Learning Center, if you want to know how to do something specific like that, you just go to the Sketchpad Tips. And we're looking here at pasting, so that would be under edit. And then it has uh, <clears throat> working with pictures, so you could look here to see how it is that you work with uh, pasting a picture to points. I'm just going to copy it and let you know that I select, uh, let's see if I do this right. I think it's three points that you have to select. And then you go edit, paste picture. And so the way that works is that it's you, the three points you select are going to sort of be the lower left, the lower right, and the top left of the image. Um, that could be any random points. I made these ones work out nicely so that they're sort of rectangular, but I could just take three random points like this 
And if I select this one first, second, third, and paste the picture to it, you'll see that these three points are sort of the control points of that picture. So, you know, that controls it this way and this way and this way. So, uh, so now I've got sort of my, 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 my chair in a frame, and I'm ready to attach it. And so the first thing I might think of doing is say, okay, I'm going to take this point and attach it to this point. So let's see what happens. So I will merge those points, and now I can just rotate this. But look what happens. All right, you see there's a problem with just rotating in that just it just doesn't look right because that second one now is never going to be in the same sort of upright position as the first one because its, posi its position was changed through rotation. So this gets back to the earlier question. I'm going to use edit undo here a couple of times. And uh, back to the question, are rotations enough alone? And the answer is they're not. Because I need to also find a way to translate my image to each of those points on the circle without changing its orientation. So I need to edit undo the merge. And so what I'm going to do now is use uh, another transformation. I'm going to select the point at the top of my, of my car chair, select this point on the wheel, and go to transform mark vector. And you'll see a little animation. And then I can take this image and I can di oops, I didn't want to do dilate. I want to translate. And it's already by the marked vector, so I just translate it and there it is. And then I can go through and can do the same process. So I'm going to mark the vector here and then I'm going to translate that image. And you'll see now that these two chairs are oriented in the same way. And uh, that's essentially how you do this. So I will go ahead and connect the other six chairs. I'll show you one more while I'm talking, and then I'll wait for questions after that. But I'm basically just marking the vector and then selecting the image and uh, translating it. And uh, once I do this five more times, I will have a completed Ferris wheel. So at this point, Karen, are there any questions that have come up? Um, there is a question. Could you just have copied the image and pasted it seven times like you did with the first one and get the same results as with the vector? Does that make sense? Well, you could just take the original. I mean, you could take no. the original. This one? Yeah, that one. With like what you do at the beginning where you took that one point, or I'm sorry, merged, copy and merged. Uh, I guess I could make, the other way you could do this, I could copy and paste and make, oh, wait. I could have copied with the points and, and then paste seven of these, each of them independently, if that makes no, no. sense. And then each of these could have been merged with a point like this. So that's a, you know, that would work too. But I think it's a little more instructive to keep it in the realm of transformations because it forces you to see the, that you need to have a translation. Because basically if you're copying and pasting and merging, you're translating because you're, you're sliding it over to when you merge it without changing the orientation. Is that a satisfactory That's answer? That's a good answer. I think that was a great answer. That's exactly All right. right. So um, I, 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 see, I seem to be unable to simultaneously talk and do stuff. Um, <laughs> and uh, so after this one, I think, uh, you, I think people get the idea. I will finish this up after you've already transferred the screen over to Scott. So at this point, we're going to take now our Ferris wheel. And this is just a basic Ferris wheel. Wait till Scott shows you how to make a scrambler. Okay. All right. So, so there's no there's no more real questions that are going on. Um, so are we ready to turn things over to Scott to continue our uh, amusement park theme that we have going on here? Absolutely. Okay.
Thank you, Andre. Scott, I'm going to pass control to you. Excellent. Okay. So here's my screen, I hope. Yep. Um, yeah. Okay. Yes. So we see my screen. That's very good. And I noticed that we have 17 minutes left. So that means the scrambler is going to have to go very fast. And I hope we all don't get dizzy in the process. <laughs> um, I am going to go fast enough that I don't expect people to be able to follow along necessarily. Um, but fortunately, you can use the recording to review what I've done. And you can use the, um, use the completed sketch that will also be available to you, um, the URL for both the recording and the zip file uh, will be emailed to you in the next few days. So you can take a look at uh, my partially completed scrambler and what I did in the recording and that should uh, hopefully substitute for my doing it at a pace that, uh, that you could follow along. Okay. So the scrambler is going to start the same way as the Ferris wheel. The basic idea of a scrambler, and I've actually seen both uh, both horizontal ones and uh, and vertical ones, is to have a circle within a circle. So we begin with this as the main circle. We're looking down from the top at one of the horizontal scramblers right now, and it consists usually of four main arms. And those arms can be animated around or driven around by the engine. And there's another circle that is attached here and that also spins at the same time. Now, I could just animate this point, but I'm going to want to use a coordinated rotation for both the main arm and the secondary arm that comes off of here. So to make it easy to control both of those at the same time, I'm instead going to create a parameter which will be an angle parameter. And I'll start it off at, uh, at 0 degrees, and we'll animate from there. Because it's an angle parameter, I'd like to call it theta. And I can do that by using the curly brackets, the left curly bracket, typing the word theta. And I'm about to type the right curly bracket. Watch carefully. I typed it, and we have theta. I could, by the way, have put any other Greek letter in here. Alpha, for instance, to get alpha. Or if I wanted an uppercase Greek letter, I could begin my spelling with an uppercase B to get, whoops, I'm not sure why beta didn't work. Interesting. Okay, let me make it theta as, as I intended originally. I might have put a space in there or some such thing. Okay, so theta is zero degrees. We're going to want to animate theta, so we need an action button that will animate it. And it's supposed to increase continuously from 0 to 360. Well, I'm going to want it to keep going and going and going. So let's, uh, let's add a few zeros here so that, the, so that once we started animating, it can just keep going without, uh, without stopping and jumping back to 0. Now that I have my parameter, I can change it by hand if I like. And I'm going to want to change it because I want to start from something different from 0, actually. With the parameter selected, I can hold the Shift key and press plus to change it by 5 degrees at a time in a positive direction, or press minus for 5 degrees at a time in the negative direction. OK. So I'm going to want to start to, I'm going to want to attach this main arm 20 degrees away from my reference point. I'm going to use as my reference point the point that I used to actually size the circle in the first place. So I'm going to rotate that reference point by not 90 degrees, which would put it up here, but instead by 20 degrees. 
And you notice that I didn't have to mark this angle ahead of time. I like to mark these things after the rotate dialog box is up because I get to, I get to see my preview image move as I, I do so. And similarly, I could change the point around which the rotation takes place. For instance, if I click this point here, now it's going to be rotated around that point. That, of course, is the wrong center point for the rotation. So I'll click the true center point again to go back to the um, rotation that I'm looking for. OK, so I'll rotate that point. Now, I actually made a mistake when I created this main arm because I need to attach it to the point that's controlled by my parameter. So I'm going to right click or control click if you're on a Mac, split the point from the circle, and then merge it to the rotated image. And this way, my animation button is going to run the scrambler. OK, so far so good. Now I need a second circle with a new arm to put here. If I make it just by constructing a circle here, I'm going to have a problem because when I animate, the radius point isn't going to move with the center point of that new circle. So I'm going to do something similar to what Andres did with the, uh, I'm sorry, I just did something without telling you. Um, I used undo to get back to where I, to eliminate uh, the last thing I did and get back to where I want to start from again. So I'm going to do something similar to what Andres just did and use a translation. So off to the side, I'll construct my second circle, which is going to represent the smaller car that rotates about this center point. And I'm going to use this same angle to rotate an arm within here. But I don't want this to rotate at the same speed. This is a smaller circle, so it should probably rotate faster. I could just say ahead of time, well, let me do uh, th make it three times as fast or four times as fast. Um, rather than be stuck with a particular specific number that I've put in there, I'm going to use a parameter as the multiplier, as the ratio. So another new parameter. I'll call this one k. And let's start with making it go four times as fast as the main arm. So it goes four times as fast. That means I need to calculate four times the angle theta. So k times theta, 578 degrees, is the rotation that I should use over here. Double click the center point rotate the reference point by 578 degrees. And this is going to be the secondary arm. And let's make sure it works right. Animate the angle parameter. Is it going four times as fast? It looks so. OK. So now I want to attach this secondary arm to the main arm. And the easy way to do that is just to translate the main arm by this vector up here. So selecting the center point, the pivot point for the smaller car, I'll translate by the secondary arm, connect these two points. And now I should have a secondary arm that goes four times as fast as the main arm and in the same direction. I can change the length of the main arm. I can change the length of the secondary arm. So I have the basic elements that I need here. A couple of quick finishing, uh, finishing things. I'm not going to finish all four arms. I'm not going to finish all four seats in the... Uh, in the rotating car itself, but I will at least attach a car to it. Let me run over to the picture gallery real quick. Grab the, uh, grab the Ferris wheel, because that's uh, the, only, the only good vehicle I have here for this. Copy that image. 
back to uh, back to my sketch and stop the the rotation for a moment paste my image make it a little bit smaller so it's sort of an appropriate size Ooh, what did I do there goodness okay maybe a little bit smaller than that there that looks good and off we go so that's the way the uh, the car is going to run I can change the number of uh, I can change how fast the smaller uh, the smaller the secondary arm runs. Again, the plus sign uh, to make it go faster. Ten, nine, ten times as fast. I think that would be a little, little crazy. I'd, uh, I'd I'd lose it pretty quickly riding in this one. Uh, minus sign lets us slow things down. Uh, and in fact, at one rotation per rotation of the main arm, we see it's a rather sedate ride, much more similar to a Ferris wheel. Okay, to finish this sketch up, I want to do one last thing. I'm going to, I'm going to go into the negative realm first to get the secondary arm going the reverse direction of the main arm, and then pause for a moment, and let's take a quick look by tracing at the path that that scrambler is actually following. So trace our point, restart the, uh, restart the scrambler, and we get to see for this particular parameter, k equals negative 4, what the ride looks like. We can tell where it's faster and slower. Where it's faster, there's more space between dots. Where it's slower, there's less space be between dots. Let me change to, let's say, negative 2 and erase my traces and see what a negative 2 looks like. And it appears that the car actually comes to a halt here where it's going one direction and then a quick change of direction. So it slows, halts, and reverses direction. So that would be a rather different ride. And we get to see what the different rides look like by changing parameters over here. Okay. To finish this up, I'm going to add four more arms here. I'm going to add four arms to each uh, within each secondary uh, within each rotating wheel that goes around the main wheel, and have a ride for uh, 16 people. There we go. Hey Scott, what would a positive K look like now that you got tracing on? Well, let's take a look. Uh, shift key plus sign. Positive 4, erase the old traces, and I can get this kind of a loop. The connection between the number of circles we describe here and the value of the parameter is an interesting one for kids to explore. Let me drop it back to 3 and see how this changes. So there are all kinds of different, uh, different investigations that kids could do in trying to not only see how the parameter value affects the path of the car, but explain why it should be so. Why with a parameter of three do we get two loops, and with a parameter of four do we get three loops? Okay, okay. other questions? Um, there's just a comment which I think is very interesting. It says, this looks like, and this is from Jessica, it looks like the beginning of a Sun-Earth-Moon model. Has anyone done that? Uh, yes, I have actually. I've had, and, and in fact, I showed it briefly in last month's webinar on iteration. Um, I showed a planetary model in which I just did an iteration based on uh, based on the law of universal gravitation uh, for the two-body problem, and I also did a three-body problem in which we had a binary star with a planet rotating around a binary star and a three-body problem in which we had three relatively equal masses, a, uh, a I don't know what you would call it, a, a system with three stars, which unfortunately self-destructed very quickly. It would help to demonstrate to me why it is 
that there are plenty of binary star systems in the universe, but no visible observed three star systems. They are inherently unstable. So yes, okay. we've done that. You can pick out you can have the sketch from last month's webinar to take a look at that model. It's in the it's in the sketch from the that's archived on the website. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions, so if anyone has a question that they're burning to ask, now would be the time if you type it in the question panel while Scott and Andres are still on the line. Uh, so while we're waiting for anyone to pose those questions, I just want to remind everyone we will record this. It's posted on our website under keypress.com slash webinars, and you can get that recording probably by Friday. It's usually up by the end of day Friday. Also, you'll receive an email from me with um, a certificate of attendance. So if your district accepts things like that for your PD hours or your continuing education units, that will come to you in an email follow-up. So again, I'm not seeing any questions. So uh, let's just see. Oh, the zip file. Good question from Sherry. Uh, the zip file of this sketch, and I believe it's completed, right, Andres and uh, Scott? It is. Okay. And, so uh, the, the completed sketch is available with the archive. So when you go to the archive, there's a zip file and the recording links. So they're, they're kind of together. Karen, can you uh, transfer the screen back to me for a second? I certainly can. And there you go. Okay. So uh, I, I actually didn't bring you back just so you could see my completed Ferris wheel. <laughs> but I just wanted to let people know... Um, that uh, two things, uh, we didn't get to the last activity, but when you go to the Learning Center uh, under Teaching with Sketchpad under Sample Activities, if you go to the Trigonometry, conic, Conics, and Precalc section, you'll see that the sine wave tracer that we did is the first activity. The second activity here, Unit Circle and Right Triangle Functions, is the one that connects the trigonometry kids learn in their right triangle in terms of sine, cosine, tangent, and then applies it to the unit circle. So you can download this activity and look, you know, it comes with a sketch, the teacher notes, and the student worksheet. Or you can look at the quick overview here that kind of uh, tells you what this activity is about. Also, I wanted to let people know, I know some of you probably still have Sketchpad 4 and not Sketchpad 5. Um, if you go to keypress.com and you just go to the Sketchpad uh, portion, you can download Sketchpad right now. And when you download Sketchpad, you're getting the entire software without paying anything. The only thing is that what you have has been locked, so you won't be able to print or save, and it'll time out after 20 minutes. But it allows you to play with Sketchpad for free, and when you play with Sketchpad for free, the Learning Center comes with it. So you can just go ahead, download Sketchpad, go check out the Learning Center, and you can do all that without spending any money, so you can take a look at it, and then hopefully you'll be convinced that it's worth the small investment to actually be able to use it freely and save print and use it for an unlimited amount of time. So I want to let people know, Andre, know that. Yes, Scott? Let me clarify one thing of what you said. The 20-minute limitation is for each session. Right. So if you can use you're, you're doing a, a, one of the Getting Started tutorials uh, and you run out of time, um, the 20 yes, minutes sorry. is over, quit Sketchpad, restart it, you got another 20 minutes. You can do that indefinitely. Forever okay. and ever, you can work for 20 minutes. <laughs> yes. Not what we... Anyway, I also want to let people know that we have a... Uh, there's also the uh, Sketch Exchange, uh, which allows... Uh, this is a free service that we provide. That'll, it's a teacher-to-teacher -teacher exchange of Sketchpad documents. So you can go check this out now. and. Uh, see what other people have put up there, and it's a great place to kind of uh, share ideas with other teachers. So just various places you can go. Um, all of these things are summarized on the last page of the sketch that you'll be receiving for being here. Uh, it tells you the different places you can go to get the different resources you might need. But remember that the Learning Center has a ton of resources that you already have, and to definitely go check that out. And then there are plenty of other places you can find additional resources. Last thing I'll say is for those of you that are familiar with the old Sketchpad 4 curriculum modules, we have now updated them for Sketchpad 5. And those uh, curriculum modules 
not only are they the ones that we used to have for high school, so we have those. I'm hearing typing. Um, Sorry. So we have the high school ones, um, but we've also now uh, created uh, three new books for middle school and two new books for elementary school. So a lot of exciting stuff going on right now for you to check out at QPress.com. And thanks for joining us this afternoon. I will say goodbye now and hand it back to Karen. Thanks, Scott, for presenting this stuff that I don't really understand as nearly as well as you do. <laughs> so, and, and, and thank and, you, Andres, too, for doing a great job. Thank you, Scott. And Andres, exactly. thank you, Elizabeth, for answering all those questions. And thanks to everybody else for um, joining us this evening. And again, if you have any questions, you can email us uh, in the email. I believe it's my email. And I will pass it on to somebody who can answer a question if I cannot. So thank you again, and we will hopefully see you next time, and recording should be up by the end of the day Friday. Thank you.